there, greetings and welcome back to Archaeosoup Towers for our continuing Halloween month 2021. The careful and more observant amongst you may notice that I'm wearing the garb of a clown, but there is one aspect of my visage that is not yet perfect. I'm talking of course about clown cosmetics, a a bit of face paint, a bit of rouge, something to alter my appearance and maybe smooth out my, my skin texture. Though, actually, history at this time of year in particular gives us good reason to be wary of that perfect, pallid complexion. In the Renaissance of the 16th and 17th centuries, it was the fashion to have a pallid, gleaming alabaster complexion. To this end, Renaissance noble women wore makeup containing toxic and corrosive ingredients such as white lead ore, arsenic, and vinegar. Mercury and turpentine were combined to make a skin treatment face mask. If you suffered with pimples, then ox dung slathered onto your face was the solution. And supposedly, smallpox scars might be filled with human fat obtained from the town executioner. As you can imagine, these toxic concoctions came with side effects, including paralysis, encroaching madness, and even death. In Elizabethan England, for example, English noblewomen would copy their queen, and so red hair became the very height of fashion. To colour their wigs, English ladies used a powder made from sulphur and safflower petals. Unfortunately, the sulphur caused headaches, vomiting, and nosebleeds. In his 1595 book, The Secrets of the Reverend Meister Alexis of Pymont, the author mentions a red hair dye that contained red vitriol, rock alum, antimony, and potassium nitrate. He wrote that this would lead to fair hair, glistering like gold. Though he also wrote, Remember to use in all things a discretion and diligence at the first when you use any receipt. As for an example on this confection, you must take heed that the lie be not too strong, lest that the said ointment, which I tell you is very strong, eat and consume your hair. In addition to her red hair, Queen Elizabeth I was famously pale. She had nearly died of smallpox in 1562, having ascended to the throne only four years earlier at the age of 25. Her skin was left horribly scarred by the illness, covered in pock marks, and so she caked on thick layers of a heavy white makeup made of white lead and vinegar that likely slowly poisoned her over time. As Margot Robbie observed when she played the monarch in the 2018 movie Mary Queen of Scots, we're left with this mask-like version of a person who is no longer a person by the end, but a throne and a representation of power in a country. I loved that she kind of built the mask for herself and then was inherently trapped by it. After nearly 40 years of wearing this mask, Queen Elizabeth I was likely suffering from heavy metal poisoning, and during the last years of her life, she lost her appetite and deteriorated in mind and body. Sir John Harrington, the Queen's godson, observed that she doth not now bear with such composed spirit as she was wont, but seemeth more forward than commonly she used to bear herself towards her women. Not only was she more aggressive to her ladies-in-waiting, but he also observed that she walked much in her privy chamber, and stamped her feet at ill news, and thrust her rusty sword at times into the tapestry in great rage. Queen Elizabeth I lived in body until she was 69 years old, although almost certainly her toxic cosmetics led to an early deterioration and in her latter years she was angry, indecisive, and paranoid. Killer cosmetics indeed! 
Though it wasn't always the wearer who suffered the ill effects of makeup. One cunning femme fatale became infamous for turning makeup into a means to murder. In much of the 17th century world, women were second class citizens with little financial or social independence, and Italy was no different. Women were essentially property, owned by their fathers, and then, if deemed advantageous, handed over to their future husbands, often via arranged marriage. Love was not really a consideration. Hard work, cooking and cleaning was their fate, and of course, childbirth, which was tremendously dangerous in the 17th century. Many women died due to complications during childbirth. It was thought that a lucky woman was often a widow. She had outlived her husband and was no longer her father's property. This was the route to some form of independence. It was into this world that Julia Tofana was born, likely around 1620 in Sicily. It's hard to be precise about Julia's origins for reasons that will become clear. There are no portraits, for example, of her and documentation is hard to come by. Julia's mother was Thorfania de Maddo, and in 1633, Thorfania was accused of poisoning her husband and promptly executed. Poor Julia was only 13 at the time. The young Julia went to work for apothecaries, and she soon learned to mix her own potions, the most infamous of which was Aqua Thorfana. It's not clear whether this was a recipe that she had learned from her mother, or if Julia had invented this herself. It was a poison, a mixture of arsenic, lead, and belladonna. All of these were common ingredients for cosmetics at the time, and so her access to these ingredients was not controversial nor suspicious. The macabre elegance of Aqua Tofana was that it had no taste, no color, and it was potent enough that it could kill with just a few drops. The poison was slow to kill, but death soon found victims of the poison after a few doses. The first dose created a weakness and exhaustion in the victim. A second dose created stomachache, thirst, vomiting, and uncontrollable dysentery. A third, fourth, or even fifth dose would always result in death. What's more, this grim trajectory allowed the victim's decline to appear as if they had caught an illness that was steadily getting worse. It also had the advantage of allowing the victim to get their affairs in order. They could write a last will and testament, perhaps leaving everything to their doting wife who was caring for them through this horrible illness. It should be said that at this time, Poisons such as powdered arsenic were known as inheritance powders, a way of speeding up the process and getting your hands on what is rightfully yours. But the advantage of Aqua Tofana was that it was practically untraceable. Julia Tofana began her own cosmetics business with her daughter and a couple of choice employees. They did sell real makeup, but they also had a sideline in Aqua Tofana, which they sold as a face treatment. The liquid came in a small glass vial with an image of St. Nicholas on the front, and instructions to apply the product one or two drops per night. Julia quickly became known as a friend to the troubled wife and abused woman. She received many referrals and positive reviews by word of mouth, and though she did sell to a couple of men, it was mainly women and abused wives looking to get rid of their husbands who came through her door. Supposedly, Julia would simply give Aquatofana to women of low status who couldn't afford to buy it. She was seemingly truly moved by the plight of so many women in dangerous marriages. The tasteless and odorless nature of the poison meant that nothing could be traced back to the women, and they were encouraged to seek justice, to uh, request investigations into how their husband had died so suddenly. So confident was Julia that the poison would not be detected. 
However, in 1650, when Julia was around 30 years old, the secret was out. A client had purchased Aqua Tofana in order to poison her husband using a bowl of soup. She carefully prepared the meal that night, ready to give her husband his first taste of death. But at the last moment she had a change of heart and grasped the bowl away from his eager hands and begged him not to eat it. Enraged, this horrible husband beat her until she admitted to attempting to poison him before turning her in to the authorities. And so the papal investigators came to know of Julia Tofana's business. Though she was so popular with local people who she had helped that they enabled her to reach a local church where she claimed sanctuary. This did not last long, however, as a false rumour was spreading like wildfire that she had poisoned Rome's water supply. And so, on the cusp of a riot, she was eventually captured and imprisoned. Tofana duly admitted her culpability in an estimated 600 deaths between 1633 and 1651, and so Tofana, her daughter, and three employees were executed in Campo di Fiori in 1659. Some of Tofana's clientele were convicted, imprisoned, and or executed, though many avoided any sentence of any kind and essentially got away with murder because of Killer Cosmetics. Ha! <laughs> Julia, Julia, Julia. So close and yet so far. Almost the perfect crime! <laughs> after all, 130 years after her death, people were still whispering of her misdeeds. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart himself claimed to have been poisoned on his deathbed by Aqua Tofana. It's highly unlikely, but it's impressive that the stories persisted. Her ghost, as it, as it were, was with him. Mm, what a woman, what a woman. <sighs> Nonetheless, you can see why I'm not risking it today with the old face paint. Fear not, though, the topic of clowns is one that we will return to in Halloween week. I'm very much looking forward to that. And between now and then, have a perfectly horrid Halloween. Bye-bye.